Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We have a great session lined up for you today. Before we get started, there are just a few general housekeeping points to cover. First and foremost, please use the online question tool to post any questions that you have and we will share them with our speakers. Second, if you experience any technical difficulties today, please use the same question tool and the member of our admin team will be on hand to support you. And finally, just to note, this session is being recorded and we'll be sharing a copy of the recording with you by email in the coming days. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our speakers to get us started. Over to you, Ellen and Claire. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, we're both delighted that you could uh, join us here today. My name is Ellen Lambricks. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Claire Smith. And over, over the next hour or so, we're going to be focusing on a few key topics relevant to IP licensing in the context of cell and gene therapies. So before I, before I kick off, I should do some introductions. I know many of you might be familiar uh, with, with Bristow's, a law firm already, but in the work we do. But for those who aren't, uh, Bristow's is a full service law firm headquartered here in London, where we are today in the UK. And we've, we have a particular focus of working with clients who are in the kind of two IP rich uh, sectors of life sciences and, and tech. Claire and I are partners in the commercial IP team here at, um, at Bristow's. We both specialise in advising on transactions um, in the life sciences sector and to together we've had the privilege of over the last few years of, of advising on a number of licensing deals for cell and gene therapies. Um, I should thank Collexology for hosting us today and letting us use the platform. And as you've just heard, I think there's a questions box which you can use if you've got questions for us today. We'll try and answer those and we should have some time for some um, Q&A later. So on to the agenda. Um, and as I mentioned, the focus of today's session is uh, cell and gene therapies from an IP licensing perspective. And we're going to look at a few key issues today where we think the kind of approach taken in a more traditional template license agreement, which might have been drafted with a kind of more conventional therapy in mind, might need some further thought. So running through definitions of licensed products, exclusivity issues, different pricing models that apply to cell and gene therapies, and then looking at some of the financial points that will crop up in, in licenses. But before we get on to any of those more drafting type points, I wanted to take a step back and um, talk for a few moments really about what cell and gene therapies are. I think this will be important um, to, to spend a bit of time on to understand some of the points that we're going to make later in the session. So really kind of since the advent of the biotech industry, probably in the late 70s and early 80s, I think we've you know, as you know, we've seen the life sciences field revolutionise really, and there's been a, a shift from focusing on more small molecule drugs through to biologics, including monoclonal antibodies, for example, through to the kind of current revolution in um, cell and gene therapies where we, we find ourselves today. And I think cell and gene therapies, you can view them really as the next step in the evolution of biologics um, products, and they've really got a lot of potential for particularly treating diseases in where actually to date there's been no real effective treatments. So cell and gene therapies, I think you'll hear the term cell and gene often used together, um, but actually it refers to two kind of distinct, although sometimes overlapping types of therapies. So starting with cell therapies, um, a cell therapy is a therapy where the, the product itself is a cell or probably rather millions of um, cells. And, and what it involves is really placing new healthy cells into a patient's body. And that could be either to replace uh, diseased ones or to interact with the, the patient's existing cells. And um, for cell therapies, the cells are gonna be cultivated outside the body. And they might also during that process be uh, genetically modified to have a particular feature or function. Um, and, uh, to note that this, the cells themselves might come from the, the patient who's being treated or from um, a donor. And then gene therapies, um, these, these are a type of therapy which generally involves either replacing, introducing or inactivating uh, particular genes. So they're particularly useful in um, targeting uh, 
for example, rare genetic diseases where a patient might have a, um, a mutation in a gene, which means they can't produce a particular um, protein. It's, it's generally done by um, encapsulating the gene and kind of new healthy functioning version of the gene um, into a type of a delivery vehicle, which is often a, a viral vector, which Claire might talk about in a, in a bit, and infusing this into the patient. So then the, the new gene produces the, the functioning um, protein. Um, and kind of on the next on the next slide, we've just got a few examples of some of the many cell and gene therapies that have been approved in, in Europe in recent years. So um, at, at the moment, I know there's been over 20 kind of approved cell and gene therapies in Europe. So this is not an exhausting list, exhaustive list. It's just an example of some of them. So you can see there at the top, we've got two called Kim Raya and Yes Garter. Both of those are what's called CAR T cell therapies. I'm going to come on to that um, in a minute. Both of those were approved uh, back in 2017 for the US, 2018 for the EU. Um, we've got Solgensma there, which is a gene therapy um, for treating the genetic disease spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and the, the other two on the slide are kind of more recently approved. So um, Roctavian, I think, is the most recently approved gene therapy in Europe, and that is uh, by Biomarin, and it's a gene therapy for haemophilia, where it delivers a functioning gene to enable the patient to be able to produce the factor eight blood clotting factor that the haemophilia patients um, are lacking. And um, so with that kind of sticking on the theme of some examples, I think before we move on to some of the detail, we, we thought that it would be helpful um, to give an example of a type of cell therapy, which I think probably is good to illustrate the, the complexities of these types of therapies. So the one that we've come up with today is um, an example of a cell therapy, which featured on the previous slide. So this is CAR T cell therapy. Um, and these are highly personalized therapies. And they use, at the moment, the, the ones that are on the market use a patient's own cells. You might see that referred to as autologous. Um, cell therapy, so where the cells are from the patient itself. And the CAR in the name of this uh, stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So, so the product works by um, the, the, the CAR is an engineered which can bind to antigens on um, certain types of blood cancers. So the way they work is you engineer a particular type of immune cell called the T cell to have these cars expressed on them and then you inject them back into the patient and it can go and target the, um, the cancer cell. But as you can see from the slide, actually, the manufacturing process and the supply chain is really quite um, complex. So it starts by taking a patient's own white blood cells um, in, a, in a clinic and then those cells are shipped to a manufacturing facility where the T cells get cultured and activated. Um, the next thing you've got to do is get the, the gene for the CAR into the T cells. So that's usually done using a viral viral vector. Um, once the DNA is inside the for the CAR is inside the T cells, then you, you get the T cells expressing the CAR. So you can see that in the picture there. That's what those funny pointy things are in my diagram. Um, you then need to expand the cells, so make millions more of them. Um, then they've got to be concentrated, quality controlled, shipped to the patient's treatment centre, re-infused into the patient. And that whole process probably takes between two and four weeks in, pro in total. So as you can see, it's a much more complex process than any kind of off the shelf type therapy that we've been used to um, previously. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Claire. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, again, nice to be here today. Um, Given the complexities of uh, these, for these novel and groundbreaking products and highly personalised therapies, we thought um, it would be good to just uh, spend a few moments considering what you need to bear in mind in a license agreement um, when you're defining licensed products and what you need to bear in mind for these particular types of therapies. Um, and as with any license, the definition of a licensed product is critical. It will 
firstly define the scope of what's being licensed so the permission that the licensee has to use the IP to make, develop, make or sell a particular product. It's also a key definition uh, because it is usually tied to what milestone and royalty payments are, are made on. Um, and the, a bit of a, a caveat on this slide because these are sort of quite vast gen generalizations, but essentially in um, a small molecule uh, license, typically, not always, but typically what's being licensed to the, the license compound, the, the chemical entity, and potentially sort of variations or derivatives of that, of that compound. And essentially it's often not too dissimilar with a, with a, bio, with a more traditional biologic like an antibody mm -hmm. where you'll have variants and that you'll, you'll have discussions and negotiations about you know, what variants are included. And for example, they can be quite nuanced with biologics like antibodies. So you might be talking about complementarity determining regions or CDRs, which are the specific uh, sort of elements of the, the antibody which should give them their unique characteristics uh, and have what sort of variants you could have on that or fragments of those that will still be part of the sort of a licensed product effectively. But essentially what you have is uh, what you're licensing in in those kind of scenarios is, is effectively the product. You, you have a compound, you have an antibody, and that's you know your active ingredient in the product, and that's what's going to be sort of formulated and into a into a drug and, and sold. Um, with cell and gene ther therapies, it, it, it's it's the definition of a, a licensed product can be, can be very highly context specific, and ultimately what you're licensing in is probably um, not being reflect not reflective of actually what's important. Um, and it's usually only reflects certain aspects of the process or certain aspects or components of that therapy. So basically what you're licensing in is more typically only part of the whole picture. Um, and I've, we've got just got some examples here. So viral vectors, which uh, Ellen has mentioned, um, which are sort of harm, a harmful, harmless viruses <laughs> in which you, for example, you might insert a gene which is then carried through the body um, to, to deliver the therapy, a gene therapy to, to, to the right part in the patient's body um, or used to engineer a cell outside of body which is used as the patient. You've also got, uh, for example, CARS, which Ellen has mentioned and you, um, you, um, a lysosome might have a patent uh, around specific CARS. Um, very common are cell lines. Now, this is not specific to cell and gene therapies, obviously. These are used very much in, in biologics more generally. Uh, in the production of antibodies, but for example, a cell line might be used to manufacture an allogeneic, so um, off, off the shelf, uh, for want of a better word, cell therapy. Um, and they're also, for another example, is manufacturing know-how. Now, of course, manufacturing know-how will often apply to any license for any product. It, the manufacturing know-how does have a very sort of high, high importance in cell and gene therapies because they are very, very hard to make hard to scale up and those sort of trade secrets can be very, very highly valuable and a real give, um, give companies a real competitive edge uh, above, uh, over, their, over, the, over their fellow um, pharma or biotech partners. So these, um, these are very, can be um, very important in, in a license. Um, so I think the, the takeaway point is um, what's being licensed in is only part of the picture. Um, it's not necessarily something that actually ends up physically in the in the drug that's administered to the patient or what's being put back into the patient. And I think the other thing is, is conceptually, these kinds of treatments are not necessary products in the traditional sense of the word. I think everybody can understand this pill is a product. Um, but when you're talking about taking cells of, from, a, do from a, the, a patient themselves, taking them out, engineering and putting them back in, Sometimes it's quite hard to sort of for people to grasp that, that actually is, is it, you know, is not a traditional type of product. Um, so we've just put up on the slide here just some examples of some licensed product definitions. And for example, on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see some example definitions. These are not, you know, um, necessarily the ones you, you, you should be using all the time. They're just examples. And uh, you'll see um, a typical one for a small molecule on the left, which might actually be um, uh, de described by sort of compounds that claimed in patents or that use 
uh, the know-how um, or uh, you have a definition of a particular chemical structure, for example, and have a compound which shows, shows that in the different variations, different salts, different esters, etc. On the right hand side, you have some just example wording for uh, cell and gene therapy licenses. This one's obviously a gene therapy on the top. Um, and you, you can see there, it's not just process, you get the idea of a process or a service, in fact, or a therapy that uh, uses, um, uh, encodes for a particular protein, for example. Um, and in the bottom, you, you'll see an example as well, where you, you there's a concept of sort of using the cell line or, or whatever. So um, I think it's very dependent on what IP is licensed in um, and, um, and what treatments are going to be developed or commercialized, but these are just some examples to give you a bit of food for thought. I think generally speaking, um, the theme about the fact that these are multifactorial, you know, multi-component uh, therapies with very different aspects to the supply chain is something that we're going to keep coming back to sort of again and again in this talk because it does influence very various different parts of, of the license agreement. So uh, we will uh, come back to that. Um, we'll just move on briefly to exclusivity. Um, and there's a few sort of subtopics we're going to just talk about here. Um, as I said, um, there are various different components to uh, cell and gene therapies. Uh, some of them are listed here and we've touched upon them already. Um, frequently, it's, it's very hard for one company to have all this IP in its own portfolio. Um, a lot of the time it will be some components will have to be licensed in from, from partners uh, that you need to collaborate with. And often those, um, the IP that's being licensed in will be a platform technology. So mm -hmm. it won't be a, necessarily a, a, specific, um, a specific molecule. It will often be, for example, a viral, example, a viral vector that could be used to host various different um, um, genes to be carried through the body to different targets in the body. So you'll be, if you're a licensee, you might be wanting some exclusivity uh, in terms of what you're being granted the rights to under your license, but the licensor will be very mindful that those viral vectors could be used for a whole host of different treatments and we will not want to, um, will not want to here, as you'll see on the slide, give up exclusivity too widely when it can work with a number of different partners for lots of different therapies. But equally, if you're the licensee, you don't want your, your exclusivity to be too narrow um, because otherwise it sort of wouldn't be, it would be pretty meaningless. Um, but in this space, the sort of, there's platform deals are sort of big news, they're high profile, a lot of companies are forming very big strategic alliances. Um, and for example, in, as you'll see on the slide, um, you know, if you've got the viral vector example, it might be that uh, you're defining exclusivity with reference to the genes or the gene constructs that's going to be used with those uh, viruses or um, the targets in the body to which they're going to be directed. Um, and essentially, there are no rules effectively. So um, these are just things to highlight, things you want to bear in mind. You might be defining exclusivity like in any license uh, in relation to field of use, for example, a particular indication or for the, um, a particular licensed products such as one containing a particular gene or the biological tar carbon, uh, target or a combination of, of any or all of these things. So there's a lot more, there's a lot more different ways of slicing and dicing the exclusivity, but um, you have to be a little bit careful with that. Licensors have to be careful that they aren't granting overlapping rights. Um, for example, if you have um, a field of respiratory diseases, for example, and somebody else has inflammatory diseases, another licensee, well, where does asthma fall in that category? Could it straddle both? Could you be in a bit of trouble? Um, and if you're a licensee going, going to the point about you don't want your exclusivity to be too narrow, if you're getting a, a license to uh, use product for, various, for a particular gene construct, for example, you want to make sure it does cover the sort of variants and derivatives and, and sort of functional equivalents of what you're going to be doing so, so that you have that room to manoeuvre and you have the exclusivity that protects you. Um, finally, on exclusivity, um, just uh, a, couple, a couple of points here, and this is about sort of IP protection. It probably comes as no surprise to many of you that patent landscape for these therapies is very, very complex. There's a lot of IP flying around. 
um, and a lot of collaboration, a lot of licensed IP that needs to come in that uh, a, a company might not have itself. Um, and when a company is developing the IP and has its own patent portfolios on some of these things, managing these portfolios does bring very unique challenges. If you think about all the different components and each of them having multiple patent families, you're suddenly dealing with a lot of portfolios. And you can think of these as sort of quite modular. So if you've got sort of different gene constructs with different vir viruses, for example, there's different ways you can combine those different components. And um, uh, you don't, to have patents over all those different combinations would just be, you could, you could be limitless in that amount of combinations. You can end up, you know, and nobody has a limitless budget. So these, they have to be, uh, people who are managing these portfolios have to be sort of very savvy about how they protect these these things, especially in the early days. There may not be specific product products, and maybe the platforms, but not specific products yet that have come out of research that can be protected in isolation. Um, as I said, trade secrets are very very important. Um, and then in terms of license agreements, if you're a licensee, you know, if you're an exclusive licensee in a small molecule deal. Um, you would often be wanting to be the party that actually, even though the licensor owns the patents, you want to be the one who's prosecuting and, and, and filing those patents and looking after the portfolio. And if that's agreed in principle between the licensor and licensee, of course, there are some quite nuanced terms that the parties uh, sort of negotiate, but generally speaking, managing that isn't usually um, extremely problematic. But when you get to um, cell and gene, where you're thinking about you have the licensor who will have a platform technology will not want to give up the rights to, to the licensee to prosecute the, the, the patents right across the platform. So, but the, the exclusive licensee will want to control patents, which are um, essentially that protect the products that they're most interested in. You might have a, a distinction in your license between platform patents, for example, and product specific patents and have a very, have to have a much higher degree uh, of cooperation and alignment between the parties on the sort of patent, patent strategy. So I'm going to hand over to Ellen to talk about pricing. Thanks, Mel. Um, Claire. So we're going to move now to think about um, some of the issues which uh, are relevant to the financial provisions in IP licenses for cell and gene therapies. And the first that we're going to touch on is how cell and gene therapies are priced differently from other more traditional types of um, products. And then think about the impact that this could potentially have on the downstream financial provisions in, in the IP licenses, which underpin those therapies. So um, as we've got here on the slide, some um, kind of headlines from, from recent um, years. Uh, and as, I don't think we've said this actually yet, but men, many cell and gene therapies are designed to be these kind of one-off single dose uh, treatments. So a kind of one and done approach. And there's this, this kind of setup combined with the complexities of the products as we've touched on, um, the high development costs, complex manufacturing process and supply chains and, and the specialised teams that you need to be able to administer these her therapies. This all kind of feeds into the pricing approach, um, which is being taken by the pharma and biotech companies who are actually bringing these product to market. And one of the, the kind of key trends that we've seen in recent years is more cell and gene therapies of um, come onto the market is um, the, the launch of these therapies with real record breaking um, price tags. And so um, it's that these kind of headline grabbing prices seem to be becoming more and more frequent. Um, and and it's, it is a recurring theme for cell and gene therapies. It's the, the high price and what impact that's going to have on um, patients' ability to access these products and um, who's going to be paying for them, how healthcare systems will be able to pay for them, and, and generally kind of manufacturers point to the cost effectiveness of, of these um, treatments, because as I said, they, they might potentially, the hope is that they offer a kind of one-off, potentially single dose for severe conditions, and um, these are types of conditions that otherwise might require several years worth of 
kind of conventional treatments and care, obviously, which itself comes at a cost. Um, but kind of despite that, health systems, health payers, um, uh, pub both public and private are kind of concerned, understandably, about these escalating prices. So the, the industry has kind of sought to counter these criticisms over the high price tags by um, delivering these therapies with um, new and quite unconventional actual pricing and reimbursement mechanisms. Um, so moving away from the more traditional just single list price then discounts negotiated with payers and, and healthcare systems to these kind of alternative models. So we're going to focus for a few minutes on, on the types of models that we're seeing. Um, and one, one structure that we've seen adopted is what's kind of referred to as an annuity based um, model. So this is a method of spreading these payments for these otherwise really expensive treatments over several years in a, a pre-agreed payment plan. And the idea that that obviously minimizes the upfront cost to whoever's paying for the, the therapies. Um, and, and another approach that we've seen um, adopted by the industry and, and potentially is the even clearer way to demonstrate that the potential value of these products is to actually tie the, the payments to um, patient outcomes, so whether the patient has responded well or not to the treatment and different things could be measured, for example, survival, um, the response of the patient. Um, and so the, the companies who are bringing these products to market have negotiated several of these outcomes based um, reimbursement models with both public and private um, payers. Um, and as I said, kind of the reimbursement is, is generally conditional on, on the patient actually reaching these specific clinical um, milestones. And there are a couple of different ways you've, you've seen this done. Either it can result in the, the drug maker having to refund or give rebates um, if a particular outcome isn't met or potentially forfeit the right to be paid for any subsequent um, payments. And we're also seeing a kind of blending approach of both of these approaches. So an annuity with annuity style payments combined with rebates and outcomes based um, installments. Um, and so on the on the next slide, I, I'm not proposing to go through all of these. Obviously, there's, there's quite a few on the slide. These are just some examples of different pricing models that we've seen as reported as having been adopted for cell and gene therapies over recent years. And I should say that obviously what we've got here on the slide, I've got what was uh, reported as the initial US list price. Those are obviously some headline grabbing figures there. And um, what we've seen reported as the initial pricing model for, for these um, products. The, the pricing isn't always made um, public and the, the list prices that I've got flagged here that doesn't include the discounts which are um, generally offered by, by companies to, to the payer. So it can be kind of difficult to draw detailed conclusions. Um, but I think these at least give a flavour of the types of models we're seeing. And um, you can see you can see that outcomes based models do seem to be a preferred preferred approach, both for the companies and for the, the payers. And um, I think it's probably also important to say that, that the model, the, the pricing for these products is negotiated on a country by country basis. So the pricing model might vary and the price will certainly vary as between um, different countries. And before we move on, there was just one other point I think, think it's it's worth being aware of if you're involved in negotiating licenses for, for cell and gene therapies, isn't it? Um, in the past few years, unfortunately, that there have been a number of products which actually companies, cell and gene products, which companies have had to withdraw from um, the, the European market in recent years, for, really just for commercial reasons, because they've not been able to reach agreement with particular um payers in in countries in in europe so um the zinteglo which is a, a product by bluebird bio is an example of that 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 was taken off the market um in europe which is it, it, it's just something to be aware of as something you might also need to be factoring in um as, as a risk associated with these types of products so then we were what does this what does this mean for ip um licenses so Generally, 
IP licenses for VIP, which underpins the cell and gene therapy, are, are going to be negotiated actually sometimes years before a product is even close to um, being coming onto the market. And, and that's going to be at a time when actually neither the licensor or the licensee of the IP is going to know necessarily even what type of commercial pricing model the licensee might be thinking of pursuing um, in, in the future. Um, but I think despite that, there are still a few things that you can think about, whether you're the licensor side or the licensee in an IP license for cell and gene therapies, there are a few things you can think about in your drafting bearing in mind these different payment models that might coming down the, the track. So, so firstly, um, thinking about the annuity based model, and it's interesting, I have, I've heard people think about this as potentially, um, from the point of view of a license or being a, a riskier approach, because in the, if you've got payments coming to the licensee, which are potentially going to be spread a number of years actually after the patient was dosed with the product. Some people have speculated actually whether that means that there is more risk that those payments ultimately don't get made, potentially because the patient has moved healthcare provider or haven't shown up to appointments where the outcome is so supposed to be measured if it's an outcome based. Um, approach and then so uh, potentially the licensee never gets paid for for the, the the product and so then the licensor for reasons outside of their control doesn't receive royalties on, on those payments because and not always but generally an approach in, in license agreements when you're negotiating the royalty provisions is for a licensor to be paid royalties on the sums which have actually been received um, by a licensee I think to counter this, you potentially could, as a licensor, try and negotiate that you are receiving royalties based on sums which have been invoiced rather than received. Uh, that's it's not a that's not a point particularly um, unique to cell and gene therapy licenses. It's something you do end up negotiating, um, but I mean, generally this is always resisted by licensees um, because they've never received the sums in in the first place. But certainly something to think about that risk of non-payment. And then I think the second point to think about in connection with annuity models is more of a drafting point, but it is it is a really important one to think about and make sure you get the drafting right. So in, in classic license agreements, the, the royalty pay royalties, the obligation to pay royalties is generally tied in some way to the lifetime of the patents, which you're your licensing. So you can see kind of an example of some drafting of that on the slide. But if you've got potentially this annuity based model, you need to be a bit careful with the drafting because you might find that while the patient was dosed or the product sold at a point in time where the patents were valid, actually maybe the payments aren't received until some point in the future where the patents have potentially expired. Um, so as a licensor, you, you're probably going to be want to saying that, that royalties actually should be due on all payments received in respect of treatments which have been made during the term of the patents or where the sale has been made within that royalty term. So those are a couple of things to think about with the annuity model. Um, and then thinking about this, the, the outcome base model, I think there's an obvious concern you can see for both licensees and licensors actually if a if a upfront payment is made to the licensee from a, a, a payer in connection with the treatment with the cell and gene therapy um, and then that patient doesn't perform there's a risk then that a large proportion of those sums the licensee has received are actually repayable down the line if the patient's clinical outcomes um, aren't met so if you're coming at this from the licensee perspective, you'll obviously want to make sure that your agreement takes into account the potential for these outcomes based refunds so that as a licensee, you don't have to pay royalties on amounts which are received, which then you later have to, to refund. Um, and so you might argue that actually, well, you, you, you delay paying the royalties until some point in time in the future, whether it's where it is clear whether that refund needs to be um, made, um, and uh, or you might you might include an alternative would be to include some sort of royalty clawback mechanism um, in respect of net sales that you've made that you then later have to refund. I, I think a um, 
both of those as a licensor, you would want to um, resist them. Obviously, a licensor's interest is going to be to make sure that they get paid um, sooner rather than rather than later. And I think a, a further alternative potential um, compromise could be to have a mechanism in in there. Um, which it would enable the licensee to be able to make a deduction um, against future royalty payments rather than, for example, clawing back, um, clawing back payments. Um, and I suppose, that, I suppose a further option could be for some portion of the royalties to be retained in escrow. But that's, not, that's not actually something that I've seen in these cell and gene therapy licenses. But I think it potentially introduces more complexity into the deal. Obviously, you then have to negotiate an escrow arrangement as well. But it's, it's a possibility. Yeah, I agree, Ellen. It's just probably people don't have the appetite for that, but never say never. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ellen. I'm, I'm now going to just talk about milestones and actually sort of picking up on some of the themes we've, we've mentioned already and ma milestone payments, essentially. And as Ellen mentioned, some of these milestone payments, because, you know, they're big bucks where if you're selling the selling the treat, treatment, um, the milestones as well can be very, very large. Uh, I think the important thing is that is in a license is to make sure that the milestone events against which payments are made are appropriate for that product and it's, it's quite hard to have a crystal ball but essentially the, the, the especially the development milestones the clinical milestones for example of paying on dosing a first patient in a phase two study for example these things need a lot of thought in the in this context because many of these products challenge the traditional sort of phase one phase two phase three route to market uh, to regulatory approval and into the market um, i think just taking uh taking a step back i mean the, these the sort of phase one phase two phase three uh buckets are have been changing a lot anyway even with for example with traditional um small molecules and most uh, and uh, more, much more in, in recent times by biologics so um, if you've got a biologic like a, you know, a, um, a, a regular, if that's a, quite the right word, <laughs> antibody, um, it, you, know, it, you know, these, they, they have been, um, you know, they have been um, challenging the, the, these, the, these sort of notions of what's a phase one, phase two, etc. And I think if you, you look at it as a, a straightforward state, small molecule, you know, phase one, you'll have an initial uh, study to determine safety and tolerability in, in, in humans. And then you'll be looking for recommending a dose for your phase two study. And then in your phase two study, you'll be looking at efficacy effectively, most, uh, most importantly. And that's all predicated on, on the premise that um, there's a, a linear and proportional relationship between dose, efficacy and toxicity. So what I mean by that is that the notion that the more you give someone of a drug, the more effective it's going to be, but the more likely it's going to be toxic. Um, biologics don't really necessarily work that way, and the relationship is much more complicated. And effectively, this has mean even for traditional biologic uh, um, uh, biologics that when when patients have been tested, that actually all those things are being looked at together in some sort of much more uh, wider ranging studies which have different cohorts of patients and effectively you're looking at all those things in one go. And so not only are you with a, particularly with um, cell and gene therapy, probably going to be going straight into crit uh, uh, studies with critical, not healthy patients, critically ill patients, often with these rare diseases, um, you might end up also having um, studies which actually have various difficult, uh, different clinical endpoints already built in, or they can morph quickly into ones that have a lot of different endpoints. And you might end up going straight into a phase one, one stroke two study, or a, a, a two stroke three, or a, a, effectively something can morph quite quickly into a pivotal trial on which you can base a regulatory approval. And we have seen quite a few uh, mm -hmm. cell and or gene therapies going into market this way. And so I think it's, or I think the message is if you're um, agreeing these milestones, always talk to the, you know, the, um, your regulatory colleagues and the subject matter experts who are, who are close to uh, you know, the therapy and, and, and know what's um, 
you know, see, not necessarily how crystal how it's going to end up, but have a good idea about the sort of the routes it could take to market. And I think if you're a licensor, you'll probably want the sort of traditional clause in the agreement about skip milestones. So if the product actually ends up on the market, but actually has gone via a different regulatory route, that you then get paid the milestones that uh, went before before regulatory approval or, or, or reimbursement. So and commercial launch, so that you don't feel you've been done out because it's taken a, a, a weird and wonderful way through to market. Um, a few of the more basic things uh, in terms of marketing authorizations that there's, uh, are some diff there's some different terminology uh, i think in um uh obviously many milestones are payments are based on getting regulatory approval marketing authorizations is a typical uh, phrase often used uh, for small molecules but it, it apply in europe it will apply to selling gene therapies and, and all sorts of therapies but for example in the us you'll be talking apart as opposed to a uh, NDA or new drug application, you'll be talking about a uh, biologics uh, license. Um, I think what's interesting, really, really interesting in this space is the, um, the, uh, the, the point about conditional MAs or MAs uh, granted on an exceptional basis. And what I mean by that is that these therapies are tested often in only a small pa patient population um, there's a great need to get that treat if you know providing there's no safety concerns etc a, a big need to get that patient uh, the, the product approved and into market and going into patients often on on a limited data set um, with the and the deal with the regulators is that there's not enough real world evidence at that point to know the long-term effects of that treatment how you know what what you know what the implications are for patients and how effective it is and what the long-term side effects of those treatments so you get a marketing authorization which is still like any other marketing authorization authorization in the sense it allows you to put something on the market but the deal is there's that you follow up with more real world evidence that you collect and report to the authorities to supplement your data package um so as Ellen had said earlier, um, the, the issue with that is, is that that's fine, but that's only half the story. Um, you're talking about treatments where there are very few, there are very, there's, there's limited data sets and there may be no or no alternative treatments for uh, reimbursement authorities and pricing authorities to compare those treatments to. And it's very hard for them to make these decisions about whether they're going to reimburse um a, a product like this like these in a, in a country and so actually getting reimbursement approval you might get a conditional ma and that that might not have as much value or it might be a, as big a value inflection point as you at first thought and then essentially unless you get reimbursement for commercial reasons you might not be getting something onto the market mm -hmm. so um when you're working out how much to pay for these milestones i think it's very important to bear that in mind and also to bear in mind that you know that that reimbursement piece probably has very 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 high um uh is a very important factor to bear in mind when you're setting milestones and whether it's on regulatory approval or whether you have to have reimbursement as well uh to to trigger a milestone payment um Going to move uh, on to buoyancy, so we're still on the money. It's all about the money <laughs> um, and royalty. Uh, royalties. Uh, a couple of things about royalties, and the first one's royalty stacking. Now, um, if you're, I think many of you will be very familiar with this concept. If you're a licensee and you have agreed to pay uh, royalties on sales to your licensor, but you also have to pay royalties to other third parties because you need several IP licenses to get this product onto the market. You may agree, often will be agreeing in this space for whether even if for small molecules as well as uh, as well as um, biologics to be able to offset some or all possibly uh, of your the royalties you pay to a third party against the royalties that you are paying to your licensor, so that you can actually reduce your you're not overburdened by royalties um, and. Um, as I said, they've been widely used for many, many years in, in, in license agreements, so it comes as no surprise. Um, but because of this complex IP landscape, because of the need for more collaboration, more IP licenses, because they're more components and, and these therapies are very complex, 
um, the, these royalty stacking provisions have a sort of a heightened um, focus when you're looking at them through the lens of uh, um, uh, uh, people negotiating it when, when you're talking about cell gene therapies. So you'll see here some of the arguments either side about royalty stacking clauses, about you know, a licensor will want it very narrow uh, about what can be um, offset against the royalties that it's due, uh, due to the licensor. And on the licensee's perspective, there's this desire to make to, to expand it out so that it can um, keep the royalty burden manageable. Um, I mean, typically under a typical argument from a licensor's perspective in a small molecule deal is that, oh, I'm, only if you're paying royalties to a third party for patents will I uh, countenance uh, anything being offset against the royalties you're paying me. Um, I'm not, not going to be letting you do it for any and all IP, any know-how, etc. But if you think about um, uh, cell and gene therapies and importance of things like cell lines and the sort of high importance of things like manufacturing know-how. I think that's quite hard for a licensee in the cell and gene space to swallow entirely. Um, so there will be sort of arguments to, to, to introduce the ability to stack those things against, against, the, against the royalties due to the licensor. And uh, often you'll have, for example, um, the licensor saying, I'm only going to allow you just offset royalties that are absolutely necessary to use the, the technology that I'm licensing to you, not other things that you bring in. But, uh, but from a licensee's perspective, you know, if you're only licensing one part of the therapy, other core components of the therapy, with, with which there'll be absolutely no therapy whatsoever because it's only, it's only part of the puzzle, um, there's much more argument about saying, can I offset those as well? So there will always be a, a negotiation. A licensor will always be looking for some kind of flaw, so that if, you know, no matter how many royalties sort of can be uh, used to offset against the ones that are due to the licensor, at least it will never go over below a, a certain level. So it is always guaranteed some sort of minimum royalty. Um, um, but um, it, and it might be that eventually, you know, maybe the rather than spending a lot of time arguing about royalty stacking, maybe you just agree a very, very low royalty in the first place. But these are sort of, um, you know, quite, can be quite detailed negotiations, but they're certainly um, ones that are uh, very important. And I think probably the, the idea about um, core IP for some core components of a cell and gene therapy is gaining more traction in, in these types of licenses of things you can offset, whereas perhaps uh, you, you wouldn't see that so much in a, um, as, um, a small molecule license. Ellen, I'll hand over to you for uh, yeah, thank, generic. Thanks, Claire. Generic entry or competing product provisions. So um, these are a, it's another type of provision in license agreements, which is often sought by by licensees as a way to reduce. Um, the royalty burden, and, and, and these generally ap apply um, in the event that a generic version of the, the licensed product comes onto the, the market. Um, this isn't a new type of clause for cell and gene therapy licenses. There, many traditional licenses will have this type of clause where the, you get a reduction in royalties if a generic comes onto the market. Because, of course, um, products might face um, generic competition when patents covering the licensed product have expired, but then potentially the licensee is still continuing to have to pay royalties because they're, for example, licensing um, know-how. And the, the, the rationale for having these kind of reductions is to be able to, to then prevent the licensee being at a competitive disadvantage um, to, to their competitors through having to pay royalties when and those competitors don't have to pay. Um, royalties. So I've been referring to generic products, which obviously is the term for kind of traditional small molecule um, products, where you will have uh, generics of uh, generic products, where the, the the product needs to be identical to the originator reference product, so the original one that came on the market and was approved. Um, but obviously with, with cell and gene therapies, as we've been talking about, these are biologics products. Um, so what we need to think about instead of generics is uh, biosimilar products. Um, so uh, that they're not generics. 
and um, that, that, that biosimilar products are not identical um, to the reference product, so the product which was, had the original approval, but, but they're biosimilar. So they need to be biologically um, similar or highly similar to, to, to the first medicine which was launched. And, and that's, that's in terms of the structure, biological activity, efficacy and safety and, and also immunogenicity. Um, because really with these biological products and cell gene therapy products in particular, um, the, the, the products anyway will have a, a kind of natural variability about them. The proteins won't be exactly the same um, as each other. And then also com combine that with the kind of complex manufacturing processes. And you, you just can't replicate these biological products at, at a kind of molecular level. Um, so you always need to be thinking about biosimilars instead of generics when you're negotiating these provisions in a, um, in a cell and gene therapy license. And as I said, these these kind of the issues that crop up aren't unique to cell and gene therapies, really. Once you've once you've thought about the biosimilar um, point, and these types of provisions are obviously often negotiated, and um, some of the contentious points that that crop up is like how how much impact does the um, biosimilar product need to have on um, the sales of the originated product to 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 mean that a reduction in the royalty payments is, is legitimate. Over what period should that impact be felt? How's it going to be measured? What, was, what should the impact on royalties be? What should the step down be? What happens if the, the biosimilar product is um, withdrawn from the market? As I said, none of those are kind of particularly unique issues to cell and gene therapies. I think one thing that has been interesting though, um, over the last few years, really on biosimilars in general, but also specifically in relation to cell and gene therapies, is, is this kind of dialogue around biosimilars and whether they really do pose a true threat to the originator um, product. So as I'm sure you've kind of gleaned from the session today, cell and gene therapies are, these are complex products. And so they're necessarily going to be more difficult and more costly for third parties to produce them. So, so the barriers are not only access to, to regulatory data and, and patent protection, there are, there are other um, more practical barriers to launching a cell and gene therapy as well. And so it's potentially the case that pharma companies and biotechs, the originators are gonna be maybe under less competition from biosimilar products, at, say as compared to more traditional small therapy. Um, molecules. And I think one particularly interesting point kind of anecdotally is we, we've been kind of working on these agreements over the years is that licensees and pharma companies kind of generally seem maybe less worried about competition from, from um, biosimilar products, but, but more, which kind of would happen at some point in the future, but more potentially worried about competition from um, other branded competitor um, products, so not ones who've gained a kind of regulatory advantage by reference to their um, originator product. I think an interesting example of these is going back to the, the example we were talking about at the very beginning of CAR-T therapies. Um, there's been, I think, six, six approved CAR-T therapies in, in the Europe and in the US, and of those of those six approved therapies, four of them target the same antigen on the on B cells. So four of them target something called CD19. And then the other two target, again, something the same called BCMA. So there's only really two targets at the moment, and all of them treat different variations of a type of um, blood cancer. So you can see that there's there's a there's a lot of competition um, in the field, which I, I, I think is I think is interesting. Um, and we're at a kind of stage where it's hard to know how the whole biosimilar question is going to play out. I think it's something that we'll see over the next decade or, or so. I think just what's, as I said, found interesting is that the kind of pharma biotech companies are not necessarily getting too hung up on this idea of biosimilar competition um, in the future. So that, that, that might be something to bear in mind when you're negotiating, if you're negotiating these provisions in um, cell and gene therapy licenses and, and finding that it's becoming a particular commercial um, a commercial sticking point um, because maybe it's I'm not suggesting this as, a, as an approach either way but it might be that you find that it's 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 not worth spending all of that time negotiating um, that clause so 
who knows, for cell and gene therapies, I think um, a lot could change. And it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. I, I've answered one or two in, in the chat as Ellen's just been rounding up. Um, I think um, oh, we've, got, oh, we've got one here actually. Um, um, we talked you know, that, that one about actually, that's quite an interesting question. Actually, I was wondering it myself. Actually, we talked about those different pricing models, Ellen, but um, nobody's got a crystal ball. Yeah. Um, and new ones are coming out all the time. I mean, how could you, could you, is it possible to future proof a license for those types of for the changes that might happen in the future for different, even more, more innovative, different types of pricing models or is it tricky? Yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think, as you say, it's, nobody has a crystal ball and you can't know now what the pricing models are going to be in the future and I think we can anticipate that there might even be some, some different ones um, come out. I can obviously we've talked through some of the things that you can do now anticipating kind of rebates and um, outcomes based payments and and, um, and the annuity model. I, I, I suppose I suppose one approach you could take is, and it probably is going to depend on the relationship between the, the parties and how how collaborative they're able to be. I could see that maybe you could think about mechanisms for, for going back and revisiting the structures that you've agreed um, for for the royalties and uh, the other payments that you need that you need to make. But I can kind of, as I say that, I can see that that's just quite unpalatable actually mm -hmm. potentially from both sides um, yeah, to reopen things to yeah, reopen but, negotiations yeah. on the financials so uh, it's a it's a good question I think the the best work you can do to future proof those provisions is to really think quite hard about the definitions particularly of net sales and what you're entitled to deduct and whether you can set off and carry forward um, I think that's probably your time best spent on those provisions see what well, I think what time for uh, maybe one more question. Okay, let's just uh, let's just have a a look. So there's one there's one here. Uh, yes. Oh. No, go on. You were going to pick one. Oh, that's interesting about the um, defining how tight you can you define uh, milestones such as phase two trials and the license to avoid licensors trying to um, uh, try how tightly effectively can you define these treatments, especially when you have publicity on trials that are underway? And I think the thing is that you have, it's a good question. I mean, we've experienced this. We've got clients who are very um, understandably want to say, oh, we've got a trial underway that, that you know, it, it attracts publicity. It's like to get, you know, biotech will want, want to publicize that because of investment, but how they message that, um, what phase trial they're at, there on might not actually square very neatly with what the definitions in the license. And then if a licensee sells something publicly and then uh, the licensor says, oh, you're doing a phase two, but actually you're, you know, is it, is it, is it a phase two? Is it a phase one B? And also I think, I think there's, I don't think you can ever define a milestone totally, totally perfectly, but I think you have to think about um, when you know actually the progression of a particular trial so for example when you we we've seen arguments about phase phase one a so phase two and phase two a yeah. so the phase two a sorry <laughs> phase two b and actually when is it that you actually want to be paying because in the initial bit where you might be still doing dosing study in a phase two but you've not gone on to the Point where you're looking at efficacy and actually doing something that's going to be generating enough data for a phase three um, or beyond, then actually there's 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 a part in a phase a phase two where you you might not actually want to be paying of what's effectively either phase one B or phase two A. And I know that sounds a bit it's probably a bit detailed actually, but I think there are things you can do. Uh, I'll never say it's ever perfect, but yeah. Think about the the elements of the elements of the trials and what they are actually seeking to uh, um, prove effectively. 
I can I can see where we're at. Yes, I see we're actually time. at time. Um, so I think we're gonna gonna be kicked off. <laughs> um, but um, actually, is thank you. We've got a few questions here. Uh, um, unfortunately, be able to answer all of them. But uh, it's uh, it's been good to be uh, good to be here today. And thank you again to Lexology. And I hope it's been useful for for the audience. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you.